to thank everyone for being here this evening to our Seekonk Historical Commission fall presentation, The Four Oldest Homes in the Town of Seekonk. My name is Mike Markley, Chairperson of the Seekonk Historical Commission, and with me tonight are Commissioners Mike Dresler, Dave Norton, and Eleanor Resley. The Commissioners have asked if you could hold your questions because of the large crowd here tonight until after the four presentations, and then we can get into a vigorous conversation after that. But to set the background here, I just want to talk about how things came to be. If you can see here, this is called the circle, the ring of the circle of old Rehoboth. None of these homes were built in Seekonk. None of these homes were built in Massachusetts. None of these homes were built in the United States. They were built in the old town of Rehoboth in the uh, Mass Bay Colony in, in a time in which the Great Britain oversaw the colony. So with that in mind, they had a different mindset than what we have here today. Their thoughts were different. They had a different situation. They're coming in 1641. The um, planters who came into Weymouth decided they needed to find a place that they could call their own, a place that was bigger than what they had in Weymouth, and so they sought to come here. This particular place uh, was known by the native population as Seekonk. Not Seekonk, but Seekonk. Uh, meaning that it was the place of the black goose. And as you can see over here, it, where it says Goose Island, that was what we call today Omega Cove, and that was where the Wampanoag had a village. And in that village, they would uh, transport product and things down to the air, then transport it around the colony. Well, the first person to actually settle there was Roger Williams. He, when he was kicked out of Plymouth, he went and sought... Uh, uh, Massasoit. Massasoit gave him a home there in the Seekonk village. Then uh, William Bradford said, well, you're not quite far enough away. And so he said, you've got to get on the other side of the river. And so they packed him up and moved him to the other side of the river. So that land lay quiet for a few years until the planters decided they were looking for more space. And so in talking to Massasoit, Osamequin, uh, he said, i got a great place for you. And so he put them here in this particular area. And what you don't really understand is, is that they were on the frontier of society at that point in time. As I was saying, the planters are now moved here to the old Seekonk village, and they lived with it to that name until um, Samuel Newman came, and they changed the name to Rehoboth. The name was taken from Genesis 26, 22, which meant, uh, Lord has made a home for us or a place for us. And so, therefore, in 1645, they became part of the Mass Bay, uh, excuse me, the Plymouth Colony, and then eventually the Mass Bay Colony. And they were on the western edge or the frontier of society at that point in time. And you have to look at this, and you have to realize that as you see where it says home lots, north of there was the native village of Pawtucket. South of there was the native village of Wanamoiset. Across Goose Island, on the other side, was the native village of Mushasik. Just to the southwest over here was the village of Wochamokit. To the due east was the village of Soams, and to the due west, uh, farther east was Kohanet. So they were surrounded by the native population at that point in time. And from 1620 to 1662, if you remember from school, um, two separate societies and cultures existed in this particular place. I'm not sure if there's any other point in time in history in which two governments existed in one place. And they existed here because of the uh, will of the Massasoit, the will of John Winslow, the will of William Bradford, that there would be peace and that we would have, they would have governance over each other's people. After 1662, um, things began to fall apart. As the society of the, of the um, colonists began to grow bigger than those of the natives. Eventually, by the time you get to 1675, there's an estimated 30,000 colonists to 3,000 um, natives. And the natives were pushed to the farther east and south, and they did not have all of southern New England to occupy. They did not have all of their normal hunting grounds and things like that. And eventually, a war broke out in 1675. When the war breaks out, it was a war for independence, 
the Wampanoag were fighting for their freedom and their independence to be and to exist. They lost that war. And the colony took over southern New England. And Rehoboth, at that point in time, was uh, a place of prominence and a place that was beginning to rebuild after having fought in, in the war. So as we're approaching the years of 1690, which was when our first home we're going to talk about comes to be, um, there is a different thought process. There, they have their freedom and they have their one culture and the natives who did exist at that point in time generally worked in the homes and farms of the colonists and that was their place. They could no longer exist as a nation and as a people, but they existed in the homes and communities. So with that, we get to 1690 and we'd like to talk about our first house, Mr. Dressler. Oh, we got another slide. You gotta keep up with me here. 16, the 1690, we estimate there was 163 people living in Old Rehoboth. Some of the prominent names are the Carpenters, the Hunts, the Reeds, the Pecks. We'll talk about them in this house here tonight. And you want to go to the next slide? Okay. And here are where those homes exist. On the one on the top is the Carpenter home. The one in the middle is the Reed house. The one on the far right is the Hunt Tavern. And the last is the Jacob Hill Inn. These homes still exist today. They're not just houses, but homes that people live in. And they carry with them all of the history that we've talked about. And as we take a look tonight, we're not going to look, we're going to look at the structure of the houses. We're going to see what they looked like when they originally were built, or we're going to hear about that. And we may even get a little peek inside as to what they look at today. Commissioner Dresler? Um, I'm going to be talking to you about the William H. Hunt House. Um, it uh, is uh, a house that has, I've got the distinct honor of talking about it since it's the oldest recorded house uh, in um, Seekonk. Um, by the population that was talked about before, uh, that we had the Carpenters, the Hunts, the Reeds, and the Pecks, the Hunts, Peter Hunt, happened to have had a lot that he bought, which in those days, in 16, uh, he bought it in 1680s, uh, uh, it was 50 acres. And there was, everything was in 50 acre uh, tracts of land. And uh, what we found uh, in reading through um, the history is that the colonists, the uh, Puritans wanted to break away, as Mike said, away from the coastal areas and wanted to go into the farming communities and get religious freedom and other advantages. So what happened was uh, they decided to farm the land, but there is other much history that went on with this house that I'll get to. The other thing I'd like to bring out is, is that uh, the... I'd be remiss in not talking about the King Philip War and how devastating it was because this house is built in 1690, but the loss of life and the atrocities that happened in New England was the worst that could have ever happened. The Native Americans had 3,400 people that fought, and New England Confederation and, and its side had 3,500, so it was about equal. The casualties on the Native American side were 3,000, and the casualties on the New England Confederation was 1,000. This was the greatest loss of life that, in, in percentage and in per capita probably of any war that we've ever had. But for New England, it was devastating. So to have this and show that somebody prospered and could build a house and could carry on is quite quite uh, admirable. So I want to talk to you also about how homes were built in New England. Uh, so this originally was uh, starting off, uh, houses in New England were like small wooden huts with thatched roofs and they had oil papered or soaked paper with oil windows. Um, they 
thatch roofs were outlawed in 1675, probably because of the war, because I'm sure that plenty of them were torched. Uh, and people would build houses at the central core and then add to them. They would add rooms as they needed them. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so this house is on Jacob Hill. It's, um, the address is 385 Jacob Street. Its historic name, as recorded, is the William Hunt House. The date of construction was noted as 1690 for the central core of this house. And the source of the, the source of the date that it was built is the physical evidence of some of the things that we'll see in pictures in a minute. The central chimney, uh, the style and the form, is the cent central chimney, uh, which is used for heat uh, and for cooking. The foundation's field stone. The wall trim is new wood clapboards. Uh, the roof is asphalt shingles. The outbuilding has a small garage. Um, the original was a single west room, possibly two stories east, and half added in the 18th century. And now the acreage has become less than one acre. So it's gone from 50 acres in 1690 to less than an acre now. The setting is rural and suburban. So it's situated on a slight rise on Jacob Street near the Rehoboth Line and currently faces northward, um, generally towards the street, but although the house faces northwest at a slight angle, directions in the description on the floor plans have simplified it to due north. Um, next, please. Oh boy. Um, okay. So that one just shows the back and the side of the house. Next. Okay, this is the first floor southeast room. This shows the original two ovens on the left, large fireplace. Usually when, in colonial times, um, this is part of a keeping room. And a keeping room in the 17th century was the main room in a prosperous New England home. It was their living room. It was used as um, a dining room also. In it, interestingly enough, carpets were placed on tables because they were too valuable to be put on floors. Um, it was off the kitchen so that whoever was preparing the meal could watch the children. And it was called a keeping room because it would keep you warm on a cold night because you'd sleep around this fireplace. So with ever drafts or whatever openings there were, because windows weren't, in, glass windows weren't invented yet, um, it would keep you warm in this area. Uh, today, the keeping room is ma has many names, depending on your geographical location, such as your, your family room, your living room, your great room, or your hearth room. Um, to, and today, a fireplace and, a, and a, a large screen TV is probably in, your, is in that room and it's evolved into something a lot different. The whole idea of keeping this keeping room was to have the family in a gathering room near the kitchen and um, chairs were a luxury and usually the father had a chair and everyone else sat on a bench and they used chests for storage, which is interesting. Okay, this is uh, showing the other historic part of the house, which is uh, the basement. It shows support beams under the west room and the hearth projecting partially box beam. It's uh, mortared into stone, it's chimney base, and no it shows the floor joists that are let right into the beam, as you can see. Okay, this shows um, original an original fireplace on the in the back side of that and uh, back side of that pot belly stove and um, the original exposed beams on top and the wooden floor. This shows a fireplace in the southwest corner of the house with a federal mantle. Okay, this is a second floor southwest room and it's a fireplace wall. Uh, with a horizontal trim. This is a small fireplace, pretty simple mantle, 
uh, and it's got board wainscoting. Uh, this is a present day kitchen. Um, it's showing a summer main beam, which is load bearing, uh, exposed beams on top, and a wooden floor, and a, a very nice job of uh, bringing it to date. Next. Here's another picture of, uh, of uh, the, um, the 385. Yeah, uh, with, uh, to note, this is how it's uh, just been uh, updated now. And an, an interesting thing is that some of the historians think that it was a, um, a uh, stone ender house, which was only popular or mostly popular in Rhode Island. And what, what happened was is that the, the chimney and the stone end of the chimney became the start of the keeping room. So you'd have one, the keeping room, and then you'd have another two-story house after it which does make sense in the original house, in the original core that was found here. And uh, that was popular in Rhode Island. Uh, is that it? Okay. Well, thank you very much for the honor of having this uh, interesting house. Okay, if you can hear me okay, my name is uh, Dave Norton, and we're gonna cover the second oldest house in uh, Seekonk, which is the Reed House, which is on, uh, Reed Street, and it was constructed in 1703. And that's a, uh, that's a picture that was in the, uh, going way back there. You can see it's got a uh, rail fence in front of it. I, I can do it right here. It's got a rail, rail fence in front of it, and that's what it looks like today. It's a terrific, uh, <laughs> terrific looking house. Uh, and a lot, a lot of these homes, uh, the original, original house is over on the, uh, kind of on the right side, and then they expanded over the years. You find that's uh, fairly typical with a lot of these different uh, older homes that we have here in Seekonk. And that's the original fireplace. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a tour inside the home, and it's uh, really tremendously immaculately done. I mean, it's an excellent, excellent place to uh, to visit if you ever have that opportunity. And that's the original uh, fireplace there that was constructed in uh, 1703. And we're gonna have, uh, gonna tell you a little bit of story here. This I took on the second floor. These are the large wood, uh, pine wood planks on the second floor. That's what's consisted on the second floor. And what I did to give you a relative positioning, I put a, a 12 inch ruler down there you can see how wide these are. They're probably 16 inches wide. And there's a, a reason for that, and I want to uh, get into that a little bit. And we're talking about King George I. You're going to ask, why are we talking about King George I? Well, back then, of course, uh, King George and England, they were uh, <laughs> in control of the colonies. This was before the Revolutionary War. And basically... He impacts all of uh, Seekonk as we know it, and I'll show, I'll show you why, and I'll show you what uh, the floorboard, uh, how that comes to being. And here's a tree. This is called a, uh, it's a pine tree. It's called the Eastern uh, Pine Tree. It's one of the largest trees around. Now, back in the day over in England, during the uh, Middle Ages, uh, they cut down all the trees in England. <laughs> They didn't have a lot of trees like this. And over here in the United States, someone got word back to them that, wait a minute, this is terrific here. You look at these trees, they're 150 feet tall. They're nice and straight. So the, the King George I got involved in here, and he said, I own it, and these are going to be my trees. So if you own any property, for instance, I'll take Seekonk, the King George owned your tree if it's as greater than uh, a four-foot uh, diameter. He owns your tree. <laughs> and this is what they would do. He would have a uh, sort of like a, a constable or a <laughs> uh, director of the uh, tree management, if you will, working for the British government. He would go to every town. And right after the, uh, just before the winter, a lot of foliage is off a lot of, a lot of the trees. 
he would come out with his men and they would have a hatchet and they would cut in the side of the tree. Anything over 24 inches in diameter on the tree, they would make their mark, the king's mark. That's what they call it, the king's mark. So you can imagine now, if you look in the Seekonk and your background or whatever, every tree you can see, <laughs> back then these people would go and actually mark it, which means you can't cut the tree and they would tax you and fine you every time the, the tree was missing. They took a complete inventory. And what were they for? Why, why, do you, why do you think they needed all these trees? This is what they were for. The masts on the ships. The Royal Navy, the largest navy in the world, and they loved these trees here. And it's the only place they could get it in the United States. Because the pine, first of all, it was light. And second of all, it could, a little bit of a flexibility. And it was absolutely perfect, nice and straight for the masts. And so if you had a home at that time under King George, if you had any floorboards or any planks greater than 24 inches in width, they would fine you. Very, very expensive type of thing. Now the colonials uh, in Seekonk and Rehoboth and whatever uh, completely disregarded this. <laughs> they, they would cut the trees down or they, or they, or they would take the put them on a smaller diameter tree, make the mark or whatever like that. It, it's it's quite, uh, quite interesting. So I just wanted to tell uh, the Reed family, I did uh, a little bit of homework on this to try to find out what, about this history of the, uh, the large uh, diameter uh, boards and trees. Now, if you take a look at this, this is the first New England flag, 1775, and you wonder, you see a tree up there, that's what it is. And they say the actual cause for the American Revolution, everybody thinks it was the Boston Tea Party and it was a tea and a taxation. That's only half of the cause. The other was what affected everyone is the taxation they had in all the pine trees. And the settlers here were really upset about that, that the king actually owned all these pine trees. And that was actually one of the reasons for the start of the American Revolution. Now, we'll go to the backyard here. It's a tremendous backyard. Um, and I'm fortunate to take this picture here. And they, they told me a story. It's, it's really interesting about they have a, uh, a, um, a brook in the backyard, and it's kind of a swamp land or whatever. And apparently, uh, one, one day, they were one of the owners uh, tripped over something. He might have thought it was a root from a tree or whatever, and he took a look at it and whatever. And lo and behold, when he dug it up, it was actually a weapon that he found in the backyard. And it was actually cleaned up, preserved, and passed on from owner to owner over, over the years. So I went in the backyard. I'm, I'm always very curious. I have to, I have to check this out, you know. <laughs> so, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put the house aside. Let's go in the backyard. I want to see this. <laughs> it could be a good story here. So we went in the backyard. And that's a picture where it was. It's uh, by tradition packed, you know, passed down. And that's what was dug up. And it's really curious. Uh, it's in great shape. Who knows how long it's been down there. And I just took, uh, I'm really trying to find out about this. So anyone who's involved in, uh, in weapons or other things like that, let us know. We'd love to date this. But it has a lot of characteristics. If you notice... Uh, just the way it's shaped, it just crossed me like, what is this here? So I, I decided to do a little research. And you notice on the top of the uh, rifle, you can, you can see up there, they got a scallop of a seashell. It's got all these nice carvings on it. And I said, that's kind of interesting. So I did some more research. And what I think it is, is a crossbow. And, that, and I looked that up. That's an, called an English crossbow from about uh, 1650 to 1750, that's what they used over in England. So maybe this could be a, an excellent artifact for, this, for the town of Seekonk or whatever, to have something this valuable rather than just a, um, just a uh, traditional musket. And you can see that, see what they did here. They have a, uh, once again, that's, a, that's not that musket, but it's the one I got on the internet, and it shows how they, they took a lot of, they carved them all out like that. And that's the, uh, the reed house. So you never know when you visit some of these homes what you can find. 
Now the next one I'm going to cover is the uh, Carpenter House. This was on uh, Oak Hill Avenue. And that's an older picture of it. And uh, we're trying to trace that, uh, that back to the original owners. So if anyone's involved in uh, genealogy and knows history on some of these houses, it's uh, kind of sparse what they have here on the uh, our historical records. But uh, maybe you can uh, join us on a monthly meeting that we have on our historical commission and help us out a little bit. Th there was only, at this time this picture was taken, there were only two salt box type houses in the town of Seekonk, and this was one of them. And by that I mean you can see almost see on the side of there where the, the roof goes down and then it goes almost down to the ground on the back. That's your traditional uh, salt box. And that's what it looked like. It was, um, it was vacant for about two years here. And it was scheduled to be, to be demolished. Now, what we did is, of course, if it's privately owned and um, when it's scheduled for demolish, what we like to do with the Historical Commission, uh, we certainly don't have any, any control of that aspect of it, but we liked, what we did is um, we contacted a group that restores houses all across New England. And we said, if you can get in contact with the owner of the property, maybe you can work on an agreement, maybe he'll let you uh, take the house apart. And they, I guess they worked out an agreement, which is very fortunate to us. And what, what they did was, uh, which worked out very well, this company comes in and they do a complete survey of the house before they take it apart. They take all the beams, they take all the rooms, they do a blueprints, drawings of all the rooms, everything. How every single board goes, they tag it, they carefully take it all apart, they put it in a trailer truck and, and put it away and... and um, but we asked, um, and we got cooperation, which is very fortunate. And I said, "Look, before you before you demolish that for history, if you can let me go inside and take some pictures of this, just for the historical record." And so I'm going to show you some pictures here, and uh, it's interesting. So you can see it as they demolish it. You can see the construction of the early house, and you can see here's one of the one of the chimneys. It's kind of characteristic. You can see all the uh, original root, uh, beams. You can see how the brick is cascaded up. That's how they had the central fireplace in the center of the house. It's really fascinating when you start to see this because a lot of these, uh, uh, everything's all enclosed or whatever and you don't really see the original construction. And there's another room. You can see how low the ceilings are. <laughs> and all, they all, all had the original hardwood flooring. And there's another fireplace. The fireplace is around on in different rooms all around the central fireplace. And it's amazing if you go up on a sort of a, an attic area, they have a stairway. <laughs> if you can see the pitch on this, that's amazing, that, stair, that stairway. It's almost vertical to go up there on the, uh, on the loft. And this is, this is a, a kind of a before and after here. Before they did a, a demo on the house, I took this picture. I thought this was, this was pretty good. It's the... Uh, the inside of the house, you can see all the hardwood floors, and you can, you can see how it was all, all the beams and everything were, were all encased. And to get an idea of what it looked back in the uh, colonial days, this was um, uh, 1711, this house was constructed. So you can take a look at this picture, and I'll show you the next one here. And that's to give you an idea, that's what it must have looked like originally back in the day. And, of course, you can see where the floor sagged a little bit there, and they had a splice there for some of the, some of the beams. It's really interesting when you actually go in and, uh, and check out some of, these, uh, some of these houses. And you can see the walls. You can see how they use the, uh, the planking in the walls. Now we get back to King George I. Now, since they took, they took this uh, apart, I was curious to see if they had any wood floors greater than 23 inches. <laughs> Since I learned all about that, and I said, well, gee, I don't, I don't see the wood floors look pretty good. They're under 23 inches. That looks good. But when they started pulling the, the, uh, the sidewall apart, here's what I found. So we're in violation here. So uh, I guess King George would have found, find these people a large amount of money. I think back then, as uh, what I read in research, 100 pounds per tree. 
And however they, uh, how many boards they figure they can get out of a tree, that's another part I have to do a little research on. And when they took it apart, they actually had a crew that came, a uh, couple of young fellows, a great summer job. They took the, all the fireplaces down brick by brick, and they stood there with hammer and chisel, knocking off all the mortar to, make, to preserve all the bricks. Now, at the last, what I asked them, I said, okay, what are you going to do with this? Put it in the storage or whatever. The last I heard, uh, someone purchased this house, and it was supposed to be reassembled exactly the way it was in Chatham. Uh, whether that fell through or not, I don't know. But that, that's what they do. A lot of people really, really enjoy doing this, taking all the original history, putting it all back together. So if we ever find out wherever this house gets reconstructed, I'll let everybody know about it. And just one other footnote I forgot to mention on the Reed House. Um, it had a, a multi-purpose. When, when we went in there, I, I, I just figured it was just, just a family house for generations and generations. But it, and I, when I spoke to the uh, homeowner on it, she said, you know, we found something strange here when we opened up our closet. And I said, what, what was that? He said, well, generally in the closet you have a clothes rack on the top. She said, yeah. I said, okay. But down about three feet off the ground, there was a whole rack there with all where, where coats were going to be. Apparently, it was an old schoolhouse. <laughs> and the kids would come in, they would open the closet, and they would, the kids would come in and hang up, their, hang up their clothes like that. Now, we'll have to do some more research. What's fascinating about this, this whole, this whole journey here of finding the oldest houses is that there's a lot more you can investigate. There's lots more you can find out about the town. Um, I'm not here to tell you it was the first schoolhouse in Seekonk, but uh, it's certainly interesting to, uh, to check that out. So that covers the, uh, the Reed House, and it also covers uh, the Carpenter House. That's no longer here. So basically, we'll go to uh, Jacob Hill next. I want to thank Dave first of all. He's a little shy if you haven't noticed, but he oh, he put this whole thing together, the slides and everything. So I, I really um, appreciate you put, doing this. He's one of the hardest working commissioners that we have. Uh, my name is Eleanor Rezik. My husband and I, um, I can speak from uh, experience, I guess. Um, we've actually owned the property that I'm going to speak about since 1991. So, um, and we were fortunate enough at the very beginning um, that the previous owners took the time to actually commission Dr. Earhart. I don't know how many of you are from Seekonk, but he was a wonderful historian. And a lot of the information that we've given you today actually comes from uh, a lot of the research that he did. So um, Dr. Earhart actually put a 90-page uh retrospect book together and I believe the library has a copy there's a copy in in um, um, the uh, Library of Congress and of course we have a copy as well and so um, it kind of got us started but we found the more that we thought we knew we found that there's a lot that we didn't know so we're still every day learning more and more about our property um, this is a pretty recent picture obviously the the uh, we don't have one that goes back to 1722 but that's when the original building was built but I like this picture because I can kind of tell you there's been a lot of changes that have been done, especially in 1915. And I don't want to jump ahead, but um, the property has been researched. Let me go back again. Sorry. Um, when we were talking about the Ring of the Green and the original plant, uh, Seekonk planters, 
um, the property actually goes back to one of those, and it ha actually was Joseph Peck that was the original owner of the land. That is after the Wampanoag Indians. So they were the first um, owners of the property. And then, uh, and then in 1722, there was uh, a Thomas Allen that had 10 children. So they needed a large home. And I don't know if you've noticed, um, all of the homes that the four houses that you looked at today, all are pretty similar with the central chimney there. And uh, they're colonial homes. And oh, and I do have a secret, please don't tell, what was it, King George? But underneath the clapboards, when we were doing some renovating, there were um, boards that looked exactly like the previous Remember Carpenter house, to, over 23 inches, so don't tell anyone. All right, so um, first of all, uh, oh, could you just go back? Sorry. Yeah, so I just wanted to point out a couple of things. So the Allen family purchased uh, the property and they built this home. Basically, it was this part, a central door, central chimney, not these. That was an add-on, and I'll talk about that in a minute. What's nice is there's a beautiful dental molding that co goes underneath the rafters here, and um, that gives the house a little bit of character. You also see um, a herringbone brick walkway, which we discovered underneath the encroached um, grass in the front. Uh, let's see, what else? All right, so 10 children, they needed a big house. This side was an add-on, this, side. Um, I'll, I think we have another picture which shows when the, some of the renovating was done. So you probably are wondering, it's called Jacob Hill and this is Jacob Hill. This is the neighborhood is Jacob Hill and then this is the original house that um, is called Jacob Hill. So where did that name come? come from. Well, in 1792, there was a Deacon Calvin Jacob, which he purchased the property at that point. There was um, some relationship between the Allens and the Jacobs. They were married, I think, um, related back in old England. So in now they're, um, they all came over to New England. Now you can advance to the next one. So, um, uh, 1792, and then, uh, so basically the house remained in the family for over a um, 100 years, and then the next significant thing was the Grosvenor family. Now that's National Geographic Grosvenors. They're, they were from the east side of Providence. This is when the wealth started coming into Seekonk, and um, they always, um, they came out here to ride horses, and they always considered Seekonk to be kind of like the countryside to Providence. They used to ride their horses out here and um, they wanted a country home. So this is what they purchased. And the Grosvenors, now um, William Grosvenor was married to Alexander Graham Bell's daughter, Mary Graham Bell. So um, some famous names. And so they purchased the home, and what they did was they did they uh, expanded it they added on the side portion here they added on this whole um, section in the back for servants quarters and a larger kitchen the, across the top which gives um, the house the character is rounded dormers um, and then on the other side was a sleeping porch i don't know if we have a photo of that one um, Okay, no, this is the side servants' quarters and a side entrance. Okay, so that's 1915. 
And what I'm passing around now kind of ties in with that because after um, they, they did their renovations, um, you know, of course, their friends started coming to ride their horses as well. And um, those were the Vanderbilts and the Firestones and the Aldriches. So all these big names actually came out to Seekonk to ride their horses, and they decided that they wanted a hunt club. So they um, incorporated, and in 1924, they became the Jacobs hill hunt and so they used this building as the clubhouse and they built a big barn in the back there is a car and then there's a carriage house which was the original barn to 1722 but they made that into a carriage house because they needed um uh storage for their carriages and that's what a carriage house is made for uh, okay, we can kind of, okay, back in, before the, the, um, the Groveners, um, we had coaches that went from Providence to Taunton, and basically there was a house here, a house there, and wherever. There was no Route 44, in other words, so the road kind of went from like if you have 44 here, the road kind of went back and forth and the roads went to wherever people were living rather than now people go to the road to get somewhere. So this was actually a coach stop. If you notice, there's seats here and people would come and wait just like a bus stop. They would wait for the coach. And so somehow we've been able to keep fixing, well, my husband has been fixing that for I don't know how many times in the 26 years that we've owned it, but it's still standing. We can go to the next one. Notice the her herringbone um, walkway, too, that goes right to the front door. Okay, this shows one of the interior um, fireplaces. It's actually in a bedroom. This is, um, it was a nursery when the Groveners um, redid the, um, the building. Um, this one doesn't really have too much character in the mantle. You know, the original mantles, I don't know if you remember back to the oldest house, there was a very plain mantle. Well, that's really how the man, there was no mantle. It was, the uh, fireplaces were used, they were functional. They were used for heating. And so, um, along the way in the 19, uh, when the, um, Groveners bought it, they added these mantles. And if you notice, uh, the it was a nursery, and these are very um, rare tiles here, too, around the, um, that, that was all added. Okay, next one. All right, back to the coach. So this is um, Benjamin Ladd Cook, on, uh, which was from the Hunt Club. And that was a coach that he used to drive. But basically, you get the idea. You see the arbor in the back there. People would wait in the arbor. You see this little guy here, because I think we have another picture of him. He used to stand on the back of the coach with a horn. And he would blow the horn uh, to let people know that the coach was there and I think you're going to see some windows these are the original windows to when the um, the house was uh, redone by the Grosvenor family and you'll see those again I think in another picture we can go to the next one Okay, here's the window, and it's just a way of preserving it. Of course, you know, we have a bed and breakfast that we open so that, you know, people can come and actually experience it firsthand. That's our way of trying to preserve this property, which is really a Seekonk landmark. But um, we wanted uh, people to be comfortable. So you have to, and of course, we 
it has to be energy efficient. So um, we've replaced the windows, but we've preserved them by doing this kind of thing and used them for decoration. So they're not lost. Okay. All right, here's Benjamin Ladd Cook again in his coach driving outfit. And you see this door knocker on the front. This is um, during the hunt club time. Um, you see some of the dental molding that was used. And then uh, I think you can show, a, you have a close up. Okay. This was actually on a different door when we first bought it, and we didn't even notice um, it except for uh, because it was all um, tarnished. You couldn't even tell what it was saying, uh, what the JHH for the Jacob Hill Hunt and the Fox. And it was painted over, and basically my mother-in-law was coming to visit, and she had bought a brand-new door knocker, so we have to get it on there. And so it got thrown into the basement until one day my husband had a break in between doing all the other work. And he went and uh, took it out and started shining it up, and this is what we found. So now the fox, because they used to do fox hunting, they had shows, they used to show off the coach, and coaches, they used to do riding, and they did the hunt. But in the traditional sense of the hunt, the fox would be hunted. But here, if you notice, the fox is smiling. Well, they used to keep fox in, um, actually, in cages, which is not really humane, but they um, fed the fox really well and on the morning of the hunt because they had the hounds and they did everything you know that what they should is um, they would take the blankets and create a scent trail for the hounds to follow and then the riders would go follow the hounds and then at the end instead of having a fox that was dead the fox was uh, got an extra little goody, and the hunters were happy that it was over because they got to go back to the clubhouse to have a nice breakfast. Okay, this is um, Joseph Conley. If you remember, I pointed out the little guy on the back. Well, um, he, the, he used to ride the back of the coach, and here is the horn that he used to blow. Um, to alert the neighbors uh, that the coach was here and it was leaving unless they got there quick. And this is um, his mascot blotter. I think the I can speak about the what you're seeing is um, one is a, an actual article from 1931 where you see Will, William Vanderbilt on the coach The Venture, which is in the Breakers Stable Museum today. There were other coaches that the Vanderbilts owned that actually were on display at Jacob Hill in um, and that was the Liberty, which is in upstate New York uh, in a museum. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, Shelburne, Vermont. In a museum, it's actually the showcase there uh, because that particular coach actually made it up over the Alps. And so the Vanderbilts were very proud of that. Okay, next one. All right, here is a cooking fire, our cooking fireplace. Behind here is um, the beehive oven, which I think you're going to get a close-up. And um, so all the cooking in this building was done in this fireplace from 1722 until, of course, the, the Groveners weren't about to, they didn't cook for themselves. They had servants, so 1915. But this is where it was done. And that is still usable today. It also had, um, the, I found it was interesting, a lot of the fireplaces that you saw in previous homes had a wood stove tied in. And this, they actually had a wood stove, but we've taken it out and it is usable. Oh, next one. Okay, beehive oven. That's uh, what they used to do is they would take the, ambers from the um, fireplace, put them there, it would heat up and because of the beehive, the 
kind of rounded, it would, um, the heat would um, be more uniform. That's why it's round like that. And, uh, okay, I think they get the idea. All right, this is not actually our fireplace. I do still dream of being able to do this someday. I, uh, this is actually a picture that I took when we took a class at Cogshell Farm. And um, yeah, so we gathered the food, we cooked the meal, and then we got to wash the dishes and pay them for it. So if you ever want to do that, I highly recommend it. All right, next one. All right, and I think that's where we started. Um, so the only thing I want to add is there was um, the Grosvenor's added this side, the other side had a sleeping porch, which has been taken down and um, I do, I do want to just add a few more things. Is um, after the Hunt Club, we had quite a few famous people. Um, we had uh, the Taylor family purchased it in 1943. The Hunt Club was from 1924 to 1943. The Taylor family purchased it then. Um, Francis Taylor was actually the head of the Republican National Treasury, and um, um, he, Wendell Wilkie, I know we're all sick of politics at this point, but Wendell Wilkie was actually nominated at our property. Uh, you probably don't recognize the name because he ran as a Republican against FDR in the 40s. And then after the Taylor family, it was the, Wil the Wilsons. And um, I, I'm sure a lot of you remember Mary Wilson. Mary Wilson was um, instrumental in um, the Seekonk Conservation Commission. She was the first member. She was also instrumental in um, starting the Land Trust, which we have still today. She donated, they donated a, a big portion of the property. Uh, we were fortunate enough to actually meet Mary. Uh, for, she was still living a few years when we bought the property, so she was a character. And um, she imported, uh, she was English, and so it was interesting. A lot of, you know, the pilgrims came from... Uh, old England and into New England, and so did she. And, um, and she imported the New Forest Pony, which is known to be very gentle with children as opposed to a Shetland Pony, which not, is, doesn't always have the best temperament as a pony. So now there's a National New Forest Pony Association, and our property was the first one to have them here in the United States. Now, Carol Wilson, her husband, was the head general manager of the Atomic Energy Commission when they lived at our property from 1954 until 1971. And there was a phone that went from the clubhouse building, the original building, um, to the White House. So it was, uh, you know, hotline. And so uh, some interesting names. And you thought that Seekonk didn't have anyone famous. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for being uh, interested in history. And please, I hope you come to one of our meetings. To We could use a few members. I, how many people are here from Seekonk? Great. Okay. So, and uh, I, I do want to mention um, that I have three videos. If you want to know more, there's three vi YouTube videos. Uh, uh, I had help from Jim putting them together um, that you can uh, watch if you want more information. JacobHill.com under history. Well, thank you, L. Well said. Excellent. Thank you, L. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Mike.